Hi, today's good person to know is Will Butler Adams. He's managing director of Brompton Bikes and they are the designers and makers of the Brompton Folding Bike. His talk goes down memory lane and how it all started. Andrew Ritchie invented the bike and has a very familiar personality in not believing what others believe to be true. Prior to Brompton's, he set up a gardening business, not your average kind of course, but that went bust after two years. And through a chance meeting, he began designing the folding bike in his flat. And truth be told, Andrew didn't actually want to make the bike. He'd much prefer someone else to manufacture it for him, but they didn't buy into his idea. And Andrew was so passionate about his invention that he rented a railway arch in Brentford and made 400 bikes in two years. People liked his bikes and were prepared to pay a good premium for it. Andrew realised he needed some capital for tooling, but nobody was prepared to lend him the £40,000 he needed, and so he carried on working as normal for six years until one of his customers gave him the money. They now have over 230 staff working much bigger premises and nearing £27 million in sales. Will says Bromptons are not customer defined but geography defined because their bikes work in areas that are congested and that their business has grown due to the internet and because Bromptons look after their customers throughout the life of the product which could be 15 years, 20 years, 25 years because no part goes obsolete despite new models being released. Will says politics matters and although they play no part in politics it has helped their business and says you're missing a trick if you do not nurture or get involved in a way that will support your business. So I hope you enjoy this video and thank you for watching. It all started with the bike behind me in 1977. In fact, it started a little bit before then. Um, we can thank Andrew Ritchie for inventing this bike. And he went to Cambridge, studied engineering, was not going to be somebody who was necessarily going to work in the nine to five environment. That was never going to be his bag. His brain was always whizzing along a bit too fast and he has a propensity to not believe whatever else believes to be true. Soon came the conclusion that the solution to his amazing brain was to set up a gardening business. He got a trotter van, persuaded his friends to invest in it and then not your average gardening business. He created some tremendous hanging gardens of Babylon with sort of pulleys and cogs and jiggling down business, business to water it. It was all amazing but unfortunately after two years it went bust. His dad was somewhat worried as all good dads are. He knew of a company called Bickerton which, and he thought that maybe his son might be interested. So he said to Andrew, look you must go along and speak to the guys from Bickerton. They could use somebody like you. He's right up your street. And in true Andrew style, so listened, saw the product, scratched his head, and then of course his dad was terribly excited to know, you know, how did it go? You know, have we got you a proper job? Can you sort of get off the bloody ladder and use your brain? And of course Andrew said, yes, yes, it was all very interesting. In fact, fascinating, but of course they've got it all wrong. They don't know what they're doing. No, 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 I, now I know how to do it. They, they've got it all wrong. <laughs> I mean, Andrew is nothing but determined. And he, that was what he created and he created it in his flat, which is on the Cromwell Road, and he was fiddling around making his first prototype and wondering what to call it. He'd been peering out of his window while he was making his prototype, and his window overlooks the Brompton Oratory, which is a Catholic church on the Cromwell Road, and that's where the name came from. But the journey had only started, and Andrew had no interest in making this thing. He decided it was the best thing since sliced bread, but was not going to make it. Fortunately, there was a company in the UK called Rally who were making a million bikes up in Nottingham. So it was blindingly obvious to him that he would waltz in there, show them his magical design, and they would go, oh my God, this is fantastic. How amazing you are. What a fantastic guy you are. We want this. We're going to pay you loads of money. We're all going to become millionaires. It's going to be fantastic. So of course, he wrote his letters off to uh, Rally, full of enthusiasm, and politely said, are you having a laugh? What is this thing? It's got funny little wheels. It doesn't really fold well. It's got wiggly wobbly bits at the top. And um, no, no chance. And he's sure that this thing could work. So on the basis that no one would make it for him, he decided, well, bugger it, I'm going to make it myself. The most cost-effective rent he could find was a railway arch in Brentford. There's Andrew getting stuck in. So he set about in 1980, three years after the first design, refined the design, and set about making it himself. He had one other member of staff and he started making 
a product, which is this refined product, and he made 400 bikes in two years. He learned a huge amount in making those bikes, and he found that people would pay for it. Andrew found he had a product that people got, that they wanted to buy, and they paid a good premium for. But he never really totally in, in, in inspired in actually making it. One of his suppliers, the, the people who made this hinge, some French suppliers, went bust. He thought, right, now I, this mayhem, this manicness has got to stop. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just have a look, see how the business is doing. Realised that he needed some capital. He was busy hand filing the, um, the, 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 the plastic injection mold parts. They weren't plastic injection mold parts. They were, they were machine bits of plastic from Billet, and then he was hand filing them. So his costs were incredibly high. And he knew that he, he needed to get some dosh to take some cost out by investing in some kit, some tooling, some machinery. And then he could sell it at the same price, which he knew worked, and actually make a profit. Because after the first 400, he pretty much found out he made zero profit. But the business case was there. He had a queue of people wanting to buy his bike. He knew that they liked it, and he just needed a dosh. He needed 40,000 quid. NatWest Bank, Barclays Bank, venture capital firms at the time, all saying, not on your Nelly, we won't lend you 40,000 pounds. So six years went by. Remember he started in 77, started production in 1980. 1982, he thought he'd pretty much made it, he broke at the back of this thing. It wasn't until 88, and it was one of his customers that was so frustrated that they couldn't get more of these bikes for their friends that finally said, look, I'm going to stump up the cash and I'm going to help you get this thing off the ground. I'm going to help make it work. We've grown. I joined Brompton. We had 24 staff. We were turning over about 1.7 million. We've now got about 230 staff and we'll maybe do about 27 million this year. We have about 35,000 square foot and the business has been going, growing pretty, pretty, pretty strongly. Funny enough, we're not really customer defined, we're more geography defined. Our bike works where people are congested. We just made the damn bike and it looks a bit weird and in fact it doesn't even tell you really what it does because when you look at it, it looks like it isn't going to do what it's going to do. So you have to sort of be persuaded. Persuasion has happened from our customers. We've been helped along the way by this wonderful thing called the internet. Andrew's philosophy is that we make bikes. That's what we do. And what we need to focus on is making a bloody good bike and then looking after the person that buys it for the entire life of the product. It just anal about if we make something new, it's retrofitable to what we've done before, and we'll go to extreme lengths to make sure that's possible. We export to 44 countries around the world. Politics matters. And we're not into politics, but if you don't face up to the fact that it's part of your business, you are missing a trick. Our distributors in countries all around the world have had to get stuck into politics. Our distributors in Singapore were the ones that lobbied the government to allow folding bikes on the MTR. A distributor in Barcelona, 12 years ago, was probably one of the foremost influential people in completely transforming Barcelona is a cycling city.